to say that free will is an illusion is really just the flip side of saying that the self is an illusion. I mean, what, what people mean by free will is that they are the true, they, they, the subject, the inner subject, the conscious experiencer of their experience is the true author of thought and action and will, right? So like the, the, the you you feel yourself to be, again, not the totality of your body, not your beliefs about your brain, but the, the subject, the, the one who can move his attention from, you know, from, you, you can see, you can d- direct your attention to, to a, a part of your visual field. And then you can decide to get up and, and go make a cup of tea like that. The, the, the one who, the, who can seize the reins of attention, the one who can decide to, to change a behavioral plan or to in, initiate one, it feels like something to be at the center of that causality. And that feeling is the, is what we're calling I. I mean, that, that, that's this feeling of, of, of being a self. And when you penetrate that illusion... Then you notice that everything is just happening all by itself. Like, and it's, it does not nullify the difference between voluntary and involuntary action. I mean, there's still a difference between deciding you want to reach for a glass of water versus, you know, inadvertently knocking the glass over or having a, you know, a, a tremor that that uh, you can't control, right? And you're not consciously initiating. Those are all differences. I mean, the one difference is in my reaching for a glass of water, it's preceded by the thought that I want to tr- take a drink of water and the the, f- the felt intention to reach. If my m- arm was just moving and I wasn't feeling any associated intention, well, then I would feel like I had alien hand syndrome. I mean, there's, there's, there are neurological conditions like this. I mean, that's that's what alien hand syndrome is, where the, the hand just starts behaving in ways where the, the inner subject doesn't feel any associated uh, uh, intention. And so it's like, it's, it really is like a foreign arm, you know, and it's, you know, as you can imagine, quite disconcerting. Um, so getting rid of free will doesn't obviate any of those distinctions. It's, it's just, it gets, it gets rid of this fundamental illusion that there's, that there's someone in, there's a subject in the driver's seat who can do the willing, who can do the desiring, who can do the, who can initiate the next thought as though, who, who stands upstream of all of these, of all of this, uh, all these patterns that produce uh, intentions and, and further actions. So, but but again, the illusion is so powerful for people that they they feel that there really is a mystery here. Where it's so like they they know that they have free will because they know that they are selves, right? And they know that they can decide to do one thing versus the other, and they know that it feels a certain way to do that. And so the buck really seems to stop here in my my conscious sense of my own subjectivity and agency. And then they're told, okay, but no, actually in the dark, behind all that, there's this whole concatenation of causes for which you're totally un, unresponsible. I mean, you're, 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 you didn't pick your parents, you didn't pick your genes, you didn't pick all of the influences to the nervous system that got built on the, on the basis of your genetic inheritance. So literally, like everything, the fact that you have a brain, the fact you have a brain in precisely this conformity, the fact that it was, you know, tuned by all of its its collisions for all these years with, you know, an environment, you did none of that, right? And yet that is all of that, that whole mechanism is 100% of the explanation for the next thing you do, right? So when when I have to think of of a, a rock star, and I think of bon, John Bon Jovi. In what sense, like the, the, the conscious subject in me, is just waiting to hear what comes out of the dark, right? Okay. It's like it's like I'm just. It's like I went for. It's like I I, I pushed the you know deliver rock, rock star name button, <laughs> and the truth is, I you know there's no place to stand where my authorship really is is um, visible because, like upstream of of that choice was well why was i looking for a rock star i could have been th- i could have been thinking of something else like the category rock star was not something i consciously initiated everything is being promoted out of the dark on some level i mean you 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 can't think 
a thought until you think it, right? Like you, there, there's an, there would be an infinite regress. You, I mean, you can't, at, at a certain point, something just emerges out of th- this mystery that's at your back, you know, as a matter of consciousness. Um, and we know as a matter of causality that it pushes all the way back to, again, your genome and every prior influence. So at what point can you claim to be responsible for all of that? And um, when you pay attention to what it's like to be you, you can notice that you don't even feel responsible for it. I mean, it, it, in some sense, you're always in the presence of a mystery. Now, that's not to say that it doesn't matter what you do and what you decide and what kind of person you are. I mean, like, it's, not, it's not like everyone gets, gets off the hook by reason of insanity. It's like it, it's, it's still possible to be ethical versus unethical and to be compassionate versus, you know, malignantly selfish. I mean, all of these differences matter because they have very different consequences in the world and they, and they link up to very different kinds of minds and motivations. And, um, so, but at bottom it, an insight into the illusoriness of free will does change a few things ethically. And one thing it, it changes is, the, the basis for hating other people really does go away because on some level you begin to view people as as more analogous to forces of nature or as you know wild animals or malfunctioning robots or I mean people who are behaving badly on some level are are, are, are doing precisely the only thing they could do mm. in that moment and yeah. the idea that they could have done otherwise or should have done otherwise it's not that it it's totally inadmissible, but but when you when you begin saying you should have done otherwise, you could have done otherwise, what you're really admonishing a person to, about is not the past, but the future. I mean, you're trying to, insofar as a person can be changed by by your criticism and your argument and your reaction to their misbehavior, the reason to react in that way and to, and to feel the validity of reacting in, in that way is to change them for the future. You can't go back into the past and, and change what they did. So if you're in, so, and so, and this is very clear with, you know, you know, raising kids, like you want kids to grow up, to be honest, compassionate, well-integrated members of society. So yeah, they don't start out that way. And so you have to keep saying, okay, you, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have done that next time do this, but, you're not, you're not imagining at each stage along the way that they could really be different than they were at that stage, and ultimately, that's true for even, you know, quintessentially, you know, evil uh, adults, right? Like you're just, you know, the, just the the must the mustache twirling psychopath who's, you know, who murdered lots of people because he likes to murder people. Well, okay, you still want to put that person in prison because you want to keep everyone safe from him. But you have to recognize that on some level, once you get rid of the illusion of free will, you recognize that that person is some is basically analogous to, you know, a great white shark or a grizzly bear or a tiger or, some, or any other uh, you know system that is intrinsically dangerous to be close to. Yeah, you know, like that's just there's this. He's not available to, to argument. He's he's basically he's just he's fundamentally incorrigible, just as a tiger would be. You know, a wild, wild tiger would be. Hmm. Um, so it doesn't mean you can't try to avoid that person, put that person in prison, find a cure for that person. If, if we ever get a cure for psychopathy, we would, we would use that. But it's not that it doesn't mean it's not a problem, but it's not a, free, it's not a problem of free will being misused, right? Like no one picked their, even if you think people have souls, right? Like no one picked their soul. No, there's no psychopath walking around with a psychopathic soul who's responsible for having made his soul psychopathic. Right? It's like he's, he's unlucky. He got a bad soul, right, if, if souls exist. If, if without souls, he got bad genes and a bad environment and a bad, you know, con- contingent yeah. neurology. Hmm. You know, so. it, it creates so much uh, compassion on one hand as well because you look at someone like Hitler or uh, the mustache-twirling sociopath, psychopath murderer 
And if you like, you spoke in your book, Free Will, you give these examples of you then discovered on the other hand that there was a brain tumor pushing upon someone's amygdala, right. that would completely change how you view them. But if it's essentially that all the way down, right? Yeah. And you can just, if, without even referencing the neurology of it, just look at the the timeline of somebody in somebody's life. It's like you take Hitler. Okay, well, Hitler is you know the quintessentially evil person who everyone should just kill, right? It's like like assass- we we wish that the plots against Hitler, trying to assassinate him, had actually worked, right? So and they were they were completely justified, right? Um, but at what point in his life would it have, what would it have been justified to kill Hitler? I mean, killing the twenty five year old Hitler before he's done anything especially egregious. Well, you know he's going to become the the forty year old Hitler who's just awful. Um, yeah, you, you, you might want to stop that, but I mean, I think even Louis C.K. has a joke about this. Like, do, do you go back and kill Hitler in his crib? Like, this, like <laughs> baby Hitler. you're, you're going to kill a baby? Like, you're really going to kill a baby? Like, it's a baby. Like, now we're talking about a baby. Okay, the, the truth is, Hitler the baby is just unlucky. It's like, is it? Uh, it's a baby who's, for, for whatever reason, is going to grow up to be Hitler, right? But as a baby, it's just a baby. Right, so it's it's like the baby is not culpable for becoming the one year old who becomes the two year old who becomes the three year old who like at what point does the does Hitler become culpable for being Hitler? I don't think he does. That does not, that doesn't mean you don't kill Hitler at a certain like if, if if there's nothing else to do, you know if you can't lock him up, I'm completely in favor of killing Hitler at a certain point. Now, which day you pick in his life is 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 a judgment call, but. Um, it's uh, at no point did he make himself, yeah. and that's true of everybody else. Yeah.